My name is Dr. Simon Bignall and today I'm joined with Dr. Tony Lloyd, the Chief Executive of the ADHD Foundation. I'm really glad to have Tony here today and um, we've got a number of questions that we're going to go through. Hopefully uh, they'll be of benefit to you. We'll start by doing that and then afterwards um, I'll um, spend some time with just me um, and, and you working through the content um, after I've let Tony go. But first, let's get stuck into the content then and work through some questions we've got. Welcome, Tony. Thanks for joining us this week. Hi, Simon. Great. Um, We've got a number of questions then um, surrounding uh, further understanding ADHD and, and really we want to get into the lived experience of ADHD rather than the stuffy academics of it to find out what ADHD is in terms of you know the experience of someone who, who has the condition um, rather than the, the deep theoretical knowledge behind maybe the causes and so on and so forth. So maybe we can start by um, uh, perhaps if you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of background about your experience of ADHD. Um, well, I've worked in this field for about 20 years um, as a child and adolescent psychotherapist in the main, um, but also as a researcher as well. So um, lots of experience working directly with uh, children and young people, um, as well as adults, of course. That's great. So that's what some people don't realize, um, perhaps, is that ADHD affects adults just as it does children. So I think it's really important to, um, for us to have an awareness of the, the good work that goes on with adults as well as, as children. Yeah, I mean, ADHD is a lifelong condition. Um, the uh, symptomology, if you want to use a medical model, does lessen once the brain reaches full maturity in sort of late teens, early 20s. Um, but you do, in a sense, have those same um, those same challenges all your life. It's just that as an adult, obviously, you develop strategies to compensate for the core sort of um, the core difficulties, such as concentration, yeah. impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Yeah. And the the uh, condition itself is very much um, based around those those three conditions, isn't it? You see very much in the literature that everyone's citing those as the the primary core conditions, as if there were any others as well. But we know that ADHD is much more than just the uh, the, the core conditions that people often cite. Well, um, increasingly. Are you still there, Simon? Yeah. Yeah. There's just a blip on the line, but I can still see and hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think increasingly more and more clinicians are also looking at two secondary um, uh, elements to ADHD which seem to be frequently co-occurring and that is emotional resilience. Right. Um, and we don't know whether that's, that's part of the sort of genetic inheritance of ADHD or whether it's also part of the lived experience of living daily with um, low frustration tolerance and things like that, but we know that low emotional resilience is viewed by many clinicians as another significant feature with ADHD and also something called um, executive functioning. So yeah. that ability that most people have to hold information in working memory and using that to problem solve and analyze and plan their actions or how they're going to execute a certain task um, executive functioning skills are also seem to be deficient and increasingly seen as another core symptom of ADHD by a growing number of clinicians. Yeah, that's an important term to include, I think. It's one that I find that um, in teaching my students, they very rarely initially get the hang of. It's only until you sort of um, understand that executive function is many different things, that it's sort of the penny drops, as it were. And you know, when we talk of executive function, we mean a whole a whole host of different things that can affect people differently. So, yeah. So, um, Yourself, you've got a rather unique position because you're the head of the ADHD Foundation. You must have a huge amount of experience with people from from different um, environments, different um, um, uh, situations in school, at home, and so on and so forth. I wondered if you could tell us a bit of um, a bit more about the work of the ADHD Foundation. Simon, your sound is constantly breaking up, so I actually didn't hear the question. Okay, I'm sorry. Is is that a bit better? Um, that better, yeah. 
Yeah, I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the work of the ADHD Foundation. Okay, well the ADHD Foundation is the largest patient-led service of its kind in Europe actually, certainly in the UK, oh, right. um, which means that it's governed by a board of both clinicians, psychiatrists, pediatricians and service users. Um, and it is the only agency in the UK that offers the NICE guidelines yeah. multimodal service. So that's a whole range of psychoeducative interventions and a whole range of other therapies really to um, enable those who live with ADHD to learn how to self-manage um, and, and live successfully with ADHD, as many people do. Yeah, that, that's nice to hear. So your organization is very focused around the individual with, with the condition then. Again, Simon, sorry, the sound quality is, is, has, has been lost in the past minute. It's, 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 yeah, the quality of the stream has dropped off a little, I've noticed. Um, I was just saying that um, your organization deals very much with the person with the condition. Yes, very much so. Um, it is obviously very person-centered, but it's also quite... Um, it's quite structured, you know, we use evidence-based interventions and um, we work with individuals around enabling them to understand how ADHD affects them as an individual because often ADHD doesn't just come on its own, about two-thirds of those with an ADHD diagnosis will also have um, a, a comorbid condition on the neurodevelopmental spectrum. Um, yeah. most common being dyslexia, but also potentially dyspraxia, dyscalculia, um, Erlen syndrome, traits of autism, etc. So um, when looking at and working with an individual in terms of helping them to understand how ADHD affects them, um, we need to understand it both in terms of what are the co-occurring conditions that they also are challenged by and also what is their particular context. So often the needs of say a student might be very different from the needs of somebody who is um, doing a, a very hands-on kind of job or um, you know um, it very much needs to be kind of assessed in the context of what that individual's life is um, and also what particular strategies work for them. We're all different and it's important that yeah. the individual understands what works for them. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Thanks. Um, also, I wanted to ask you, um, from your experience, what's the best way to describe ADHD or hyperkinetic disorder? I mean, they, these are two terms that effectively mean the same thing, but how do you describe ADHD? Well, I mean, ADHD, we've, we've mentioned the core characteristics are often very difficult for those individuals to learn successfully, particularly um, with things like systematic academic study. Um, the impulsivity can be a real challenge that, you know, sometimes people will act and say things before they've had the ability if you like, the ability to register whether or not it's appropriate to either say or act on that, you know, initial feeling. And if we all walked around every day um, acting out every thought or every feeling that we had, then we'd all get into trouble, wouldn't we? So that's a particular yeah. challenge. Um, but, you know, hyperactivity doesn't really affect everybody, Simon. And, and it, it's also an element of ADHD that can be quite fluid. So, for example... Um, we see children of primary school age who mm. tend to be predominantly hyperactive, but then when they progress into secondary education, they become predominantly inattentive. Yeah, but yeah. depending on um, life circumstances and sometimes adverse life events or sometimes even your occupation, then um, that balance between whether you're more hyperactive or more inattentive can move around a little bit. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a bit more fluid, I think, than a lot of people realise. We've had, um, and, and that's particularly evident in women, because with women um, you tend to see um, slightly less hyperactive uh, elements and more inattentive elements. Because there, there is an um, identifiable sex difference, isn't there? Um, they say, well, the stream's breaking up a bit here. Yeah. Just wonder if that's 
going to come back. That's better. I can see you again. <laughs> um, but they, they say that boys are much more frequently diagnosed with ADHD than girls, but I wonder if there actually is um, you know, a sex difference there in the underlying causation rather than it just being more identifiable in boys. I think you're absolutely right, Simon. It's more identifiable in boys because um, the, the nervous system and neurology in, in male children obviously is different from that in females and we tend obviously in boys to um, see an interplay between higher levels of testosterone and um, the hyperactivity that's associated with ADHD. Now up until about um, 10 years ago I think we were still seeing four boys diagnosed to every one girl. Um, that's that's come down significantly now, um, with some research indicating that it's more like 2.8 boys to one girl. So we're seeing more and more young women diagnosed, um, but often they're diagnosed much later because because they tend to be more inattentive and therefore. Um, Less disruptive, if you like, or less noticeable in a class. Yeah, they yeah. stay below the teacher's radar. They might be labelled as a chatterbox or, or, or lazy. But in fact, it's about how ADHD presents quite differently in girls. And what we tend to see in our practice here is that often, when young girls are diagnosed, they're diagnosed only when they've presented with things like anxiety, depression. Um, problems around food, um, oh, right. OCD, and then when we do a comprehensive assessment, we then identify that there's that underlying undiagnosed ADHD, because sadly in most schools, the imperative for a referral for a diagnosis is usually because the child's behavior yeah. has become so challenging, which is long past <laughs> the cognitive difficulties, yeah. which if identified at the start of the child's educational career, then you wouldn't see some of those challenging behaviours that are really the consequence of anxiety and frustration rather than deliberate and intentional um, attempts to behave inappropriately. That's a really good point and that, that really brings us on to the next question about um, what the public and professionals should really understand most about ADHD. I think you've really hit the nail on the head there that the, you know the sex differences are one but the ADHD can go under the radar as well and not be noticed. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that I think the thing to remember as well is that, that, that I mean, there was a myth, wasn't there, that all children with ADHD were badly behaved and and you know climbing the walls. It's absolute yeah. nonsense. There are lots and lots of children with ADHD. Um, who cope perfectly well. Um, yes, they perhaps do underachieve, particularly in exams, for example, where you know the, 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 the memory difficulties really impact on their exam performance. Mm. Uh, but there are also lots of children, because they have a healthy lifestyle, because they do a lot of daily exercise, because they have a good um, bedtime, sort of sleep hygiene, um, a good diet and things like that, um, and and because they're well parented and supported in the development of good interpersonal skills, that they develop lots of really good coping strategies, which kind of mitigate a lot against um, the kind of challenges that come with ADHD. There's no, you know, there's no question of that. Um, but for some people, and I think you know where it really begins to kind of affect people is when they're under enormous pressure, or when. You know, adverse life events happen, particularly you know, for children. Could be anything from a parent not being well to yeah. being bullied at school, um, to you know, uh, the loss of a pet or a grandparent. Anything at all. And I think sometimes it's adverse life events that um, that low emotional resilience seems to really kick in, and 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 that seems to exacerbate the ADHD. So, so it's um, a vulnerability, really. So, adding to those stresses um, might push a person in into a position where they're less able to cope with the yes. world around them. Yeah. Yes. So that's an interesting um, take on ADHD as a you know as an additive stressor, really, to a person's um, ongoing. Um, struggles. So it's seeing it not as an impairment as such, but as a vulnerability, really. So. Yeah, I mean, I think one really good analogy. Whenever I'm delivering training to people, you now I'll often ask them, mm. 
what's your behavior like when you're really stressed? Mm. And often what they'll tell me is restless, I find it difficult to sleep, <laughs> yeah. I can be a bit irritable, um, I can be a bit snappy, I find it hard to concentrate, and you kind of have to sort of just reflect that back and say, and don't you think that sounds like ADHD? So it gives you a sense of um, sometimes that kind of quite anxious emotional baseline that a lot of people with ADHD live with, and unless, as I say, they they taught how to manage it well, and particularly to manage the anxiety, um, it can be quite debilitating. So the important thing is to build resilience within their nervous system and within their psychology, so that you know when tough times or pressure waves do come along in their lives for whatever reason, mm. they're more resilient and better able to deal with that pressure. Yeah, very, very interesting. So for some people, I think the ADHD um, can exist, but they can cope perfectly well with it. And perhaps this represents a lot of people who go undiagnosed. Yes, so absolutely true. And there are lots of people who are undiagnosed. I mean, nice guidelines. Um, sort of uh, estimate that 5% of the childhood population have ADHD, but yeah. in fact in the UK the number of children diagnosed is actually just under 3% of the childhood population. So that right. suggests that you know there's two, 300,000 children out there with ADHD who don't have a diagnosis. I'd like to assume that they're all coping really well and doing fine, mm. um, and I'm sure a lot of them are, but I, I also know that there are probably a lot of children who are not coping because their difficulty hasn't been identified and properly diagnosed, and that perhaps they're being uh, labelled or treated like naughty children or something yeah. like that, when really there's, there's a real neurocognitive difficulty that underlies that. That. Yeah, that, I mean, that that's one of the things about ADHD. It's so easy to be misinterpreted as just willful bad behavior. Mm. So, um, Unfortunately, yeah. But also children who suffer from acute anxiety, sometimes their behaviors might present like ADHD. All right. So poor, really, if you think about when you're anxious, your concentration is impaired, you know, you can be quite fidgety and hyperactive, you can find it difficult sleeping. So it is really important, um, you know, and diagnostic protocols in the UK are generally quite good. Mm. Um, things like QB testing now, which really kind of help to augment that diagnostic screening. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it is important to, to be able to see the difference between a child who's suffering from anxiety or an adult who's suffering from anxiety mm. and ADHD and that's why the assessment process tends to take um, a little bit of time in terms of you know a clinician will want to see a child over a six month period before making a definite decision because all children are hyperactive, all children can be inattentive, all children can be impulsive, it's part of the socialising yeah. process that they are educated to learn how to manage those things. Yeah. Um, but um, with ADHD, it is persistent and pervasive. Yeah, and it would be worrying if children didn't show those characteristics as well. I mean, they're some of the most positive things about children, that they're spontaneous and impulsive and, and childlike and, and sometimes boisterous as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, you mentioned anxiety. Now, that's, now that's one of the, the common um, comorbidities of ADHD. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the um, the comorbidities that go alongside ADHD. Well, apart from the, I mean, apart from the learning difficulties, mm. uh, you know, it's estimated about forty percent of children with ADHD will have dyslexia, for example. So, I mean, you can imagine if it takes quite a few years to get a diagnosis, because in generally, I think across um, the UK first presentation of concern is about age five when the child starts school. Yeah. Um, but some children can wait some years before they end up getting a diagnosis. And for a child who's going into school every day, um, and everything the teacher is asking them to do, like sit still, concentrate, remember this, uh, you know, it's going to be more difficult for a child with ADHD if they've got comorbid dyslexia or comor comorbid dyscalculia. Yeah. Their experience of classroom learning is going to become very, very stressful until 
those things have been identified. So what we tend to see quite commonly in children with ADHD is a lot of comorbid anxiety and depression in the region of about 40% of all children with ADHD will have wow. um, anxiety and depression which has quite significant implications for their mental health. Yeah. Um, because obviously in children their brains are very plastic, there's a lot of uh, malleability and plasticity um, and children who spend their childhood with pervasive levels of anxiety and therefore elevated levels of stress hormones in their bloodstream and in their nervous system then that will impact on how their nervous system develops both structurally and functionally so we know that children who experience a lot of anxiety throughout their childhood are more likely to develop longer term mental health problems in adulthood so comorbid anxiety and depression is a particularly key concern for those with ADHD we know that self-harm in ADHD is about one in five of those diagnosed with ADHD will self-harm which is again really quite concerning mm. um, and of course I mean most boys in adolescence will pass through a period of, of uh, oppositional behavior which is absolutely normal in terms of the development um, as the child transitions into adulthood but yeah. with ADHD that can be also much more pronounced, much more difficult. Yeah, I mean, you can map this on, Connie, to, to um, theories of life stages as well, but I think in ADHD it's more pronounced and more obvious, um, more, as they say, externalizing behavior rather than perhaps in, internalizing. But then, of course, the cognitive elements go with it as, as well. Um, maybe we can move on to, um, if I can just ask you about the, the current state of services for ADHD in the UK. I know that can be, it's uh, an area of, of much um, hot debate. <laughs> and, uh, it is very controversial, Simon, um, and it's very much a postcode lottery. Right. So um, in some parts of the country it's quite good, most parts of the country nobody is really following nice guidelines. No. Um, GPs are not really given a lot of training around uh, neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD or indeed child and adolescent mental health so mm. they often have to rely on um, overstretched services that are run by CAMS, child and adolescent mental health services. Yeah. Uh, so generally across the state of the country very poor. Um, there are only two parts of the country where the NICE guidelines are being followed um, and that's Merseyside and Leicester. Um, in most parts of the country, unfortunately, um, medication is the first and only line of treatment um, and that's really, really quite sad. Um, now medication, you know, ADHD medications work pharmacologically, they're very successful and they absolutely do what they say on the bottle. Um, but they don't cure ADHD, what they do is they reduce, obviously they reduce the impact of ADHD on somebody. But you know, even the pharmaceutical companies that make these medications will tell you that they should be used as an adjunct to all those psychoeducative interventions so that having a healthy lifestyle, a good exercise, using cognitive behavioral therapy and coaching strategies so that every individual learns how to self-manage better, um, then, you know, uh, for those medication is, you know, is a really, those things combined with medication are fantastic. I think the problem with medication on its own is that, you know, I think a lot of children don't understand why it's important that if they've been prescribed it, they take it yeah. um, and how to manage taking medication successfully um, and again you know you can often there are so many different clinicians with with different points of view about how this should be treated but I think by and large most clinicians are, are fairly skilled in terms of their assessment and diagnosis it's just often you might have to wait a long time to see a specialist community pediatrician or child psychiatrist or indeed adult psychiatrist <laughs> if it's an adult diagnosis that you're looking for mm. uh, but I think certainly um, the state of uh, health care for children with ADHD in this country is really, really poor. Right. That's sad to hear, really, because it's so desperate that these, these children who 
the parents often it's the parents that flag up the something's wrong. They they desperately need some kind of support, and if the diagnosis isn't forthcoming, often I feel that you know treatment strategies, interventions aren't forthcoming as well. Uh, it's just I think that that acknowledgement uh, throughout, especially the education system, that the child you know does need special education in terms of putting in place strategies for them. So I think that you know that there is such a, a problem in this country is really a, a you know a sad set of affairs really. We do a lot of training with universities uh, with student teachers, um, and it is surprising really how little they you know they know, and it's it's quite alarming sometimes. I think certainly with the teachers we work with, Simon, they're often quite overwhelmed and stunned when they realise how much they don't know, and also right. uh, how what they do in a classroom context, for example, in a school, um, how they can actually reduce a lot of anxiety and suffering for children just by teaching them in an ADHD-friendly way. Yeah. And I think um, teachers and parents, because you know it's tough for parents, um, you know, being the parent of a child with ADHD, and often once the parents understand what it is, and understand and can put themselves in the child's frame of reference so that they understand. How AD, what it's like to live with ADHD, it's easier to be more compassionate and understanding, knowing, you know, how it's actually impacting on the child as opposed to impacting on me as a parent or me as a teacher. It is very much about trying to understand it from the child's frame of reference. Yeah, and I think that, that diagnosis can be liberating as well. When uh, One often hears that um, upon diagnosis, the parents you know, get let out a sigh, oh, it isn't me, it isn't the parenting, it isn't, I'm not to blame. There is actually, you know, something there we, we can uh, have recognized, as it were. So I think that that's a benefit as well. Um, can you just, in brief terms, walk us through the process of getting diagnosed then with, with ADHD? How does that work? Well, if, if you as a parent or if you as an adult think you might have ADHD, I mean, the first thing you have to do, obviously, is, is go and talk to your GP mm -hmm. um, and ask for, if, if, if in the conversation with your GP, you know, um, you believe or the GP believes that you may have ADHD, then there should be, if you're an adult, a referral to um, a psychiatrist who will do an assessment and a diagnosis. If you're a child and you're a parent speaking to a GP about your child, um, I would also ask, that, you know, parents really need to talk to teachers in the school and find out how their child is coping in a school environment as well as the home. Um, because sometimes ADHD, again, in a school a teacher might say, well, he's clearly having difficulty concentrating, he's clearly having difficulty remembering information. I know that you know, the child can learn something very successfully one day and have completely forgotten it the next. So there are some indicators there that, you know, there are ADHD. So the GP will take feedback from the school as well as the parent. Sometimes the school will say, no, he's doing absolutely fine or she's doing absolutely fine. And they'll base that assessment on the fact that the child is achieving academically and they're not behaving in a difficult way. And sometimes that's misleading because a child can be coping in school but by the time they get home, there's a potential meltdown because it's required so much of them to get through the school day. Um, it's going to be so much harder for them to concentrate, so much harder for them to sit still. Um, it can be quite exhausting having ADHD. <laughs> um, so once that, you know, once the parent has perhaps spoken to the school, gone to the GP, if the school and the parent are in agreement, and the GP. Um, agrees that it's worthy of further investigation, then the GP will make a referral to a community paediatrician right. um, or a child psychiatrist. And they will use a number of different things to measure. There are a number of um, scales, such as the Connor scale or an Akenbach scale. There's yeah. also things called, as I say, a computer-based cognitive functioning test now called a QB test. Um, there are a number of different things that they will use. And with the feedback from the school, the feedback from the parent, the paediatrician themselves will interview the child, um, and then they will make an informed decision 
um, with an understanding of all the environmental factors in that child's life because we know that the interplay between environmental factors and the genetic presentation of ADHD is, is something that needs to be understood in context as we said before. Um, and then the paediatrician will make a decision about whether um, the ADHD is disabling enough to require medication or whether you know with the right kind of instruction and guidance the family might be able to manage that ADHD without medication and it's um, I think often really what's poor is that the lack of information available and I think often because camera services are so overstretched pediatricians will automatically refer to medication because actually that's the only thing that their commissioners will fund as opposed to those are the therapies which the NICE guidelines recommend. Yeah, there's a big discrepancy, isn't there, in the cost of um, um, providing these interventions or treatments. Medication is relatively cheap compared to, say, behavioral modification treatments or ABA or something like that, you know, um, which typically requires a lot of one-to-one -one with a skilled person that's been been trained and is available. And uh, the fact that it's just one-on-one -on -one as well increases the, the relative cost of these services. Well, actually, not always, Simon, because I mean, we, we do a lot of group work with parents. Yeah. Um, obviously, we do a lot of work with the school so that the home and the school, this sort of, you know, they're putting the same strategies in place to help the child. Um, and group work with, you know, small groups of children with ADHD, right. uh, particularly at a, you know, at a younger age where it's just about understanding that, you know, my brain is a bit different, my nervous system is a bit different, yeah. um, you know, um, and we've really got to enable children to kind of develop a, a, a sense of, of the ADHD in a strength-based way and to think about the things that they can do rather than the things that they can't do. There are lots and lots of very, very talented people with ADHD and I think it's really important that, you know, we don't allow children to develop a self-concept where they see themselves as stupid or no, no. They're not. Sometimes they might make wrong choices and it's important that we help them learn, you know, uh, to make right choices as we do with all children. And, and I think it's really important to get the point across that, you know, ADHD is not an excuse mm. for inappropriate behaviour or academic underachievement. And I think, you know, what we can say to people is, well, look, here's some knowledge and here's some skills. If you apply this knowledge and these skills properly, then you'll be able to grow and develop and live very successfully with your ADHD. Um, I think when there isn't the right intervention and there isn't the right support, then yes, it is an excuse. Um, and what we're saying is, you know, you really do empower children, young people and adults who have ADHD by saying, you know, this is what it is. Mm. Take a strength-based approach. You know, there are some difficulties that go with this condition, but of course, you know, it's not the sum of who you are. No. And there are lots of things that you can do that can help you manage it quite successfully. And that doesn't have to be expensive at all. Um, I think it's better to put those cost-effective interventions in quite early because if you don't then what you tend to see is further down the line a greater risk of comorbid mental health problems mm. academic failure at school which ultimately costs everybody much more it costs a lot of suffering to the individual um, it also then costs um, the health service it will cost the social welfare budget because people haven't achieved at school and therefore might be more dependent on the state in other ways. So mm -hmm. actually, it's false economy not to put that um, psychoeducative intervention in right at the start. And actually, you know, the comparative cost, there's not that much difference, Simon. I mean, medication and dispensing costs are about eight, nine hundred pounds a year per mm -hmm. person. Um, a whole program of psychoeducative intervention and some CBT would cost the same, and that's a one-off. Um, you know, so once you've got that knowledge and skills, you've got it. It's just down to you whether or not you use those skills. That's really nice to hear, actually, and get that perspective on it. Because I think from the um, the published literature, one often hears of the, sort of the crossover between uh, 
well, as, as you know, this, this, this MOOC also covers things like Asperger's as well, and some of the behavioral interventions there are just as applicable for people with ADHD to an extent. But it, when you read that literature, it's seen as very exclusive rather than just being everyday accommodations or strategies that can be put at the point of contact, you know, where it's needed most. So I think that's quite refreshing to hear that putting those skills at the point where they're actually needed with the parents, with, with the school and with, you know, people that are going to be working with these children and young adults, I think is really critical. So that's really nice to hear. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wonder if I could just ask you about um, um, some of the issues of uh, ADHD for for people um, later on in life, for adults with ADHD, and how that perhaps differs from, from ADHD in children. Um, well, the thing, obviously, with all of us, we, as, as, as we transition into adulthood, and as we get older, our life experience teaches us, doesn't it, we begin to have a better understanding of ourselves and a better relationship with ourselves, and for those of us who live with ADHD, come into a relationship with that ADHD, um, we learn what our triggers are in terms of the things that we find stressful, we develop strategies that are unique to us as individuals that teach us how to self-soothe and self-calm so that when we are anxious we know how to make ourselves feel better. Um, so in, in, in many respects the maturity and self-awareness that we develop as adults um, means that it's, it's easier to deal with in many respects. However, with one exception, and that would be around addiction, because one of the key kind of organic differences with an ADHD neurology is, is problems with dopaminergic function, or this, this neurotransmitter called dopamine, mm. which is a reward-based hormone which we kind of produce whenever we do anything physically and organismically good for us, whether that's particularly physical exercise, we produce a lot of dopamine. But when we eat food, when we experience human intimacy, when we learn something new and there's something novel. Mm. And that's one of the things that helps create neural pathways of memory and learning um, in our brains and nervous systems. But unfortunately, one of the challenges that, that, that comes with um, poor regulation of dopamine is it does put you at greater risk of addiction. Ah, okay. So um, in adults, one thing we do counsel adults with ADHD is, you know, really important that you have a healthy lifestyle, really important that you do a job that works for you, um, really important that, you know, you take a strength-based approach, that you take good care of your emotional well-being and physical health, and really important that you are mindful of the risks around alcohol and um, cannabis um, and other drugs as well. So um, mm. they can, can be problematic. Yeah, yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. I'm just aware of time. We've only got a few minutes available to us. Um, in the last few minutes, I wondered if you had any advice or tips for parents who suspect their child has ADHD. <sighs> Talk to your child, listen to your child, and try and get an understanding from them. Mm. Um, uh, you know, particularly if they've just started school, because that's usually where it really begins to present. Um, and then encourage your child to be able to, to talk to you as a parent um, about what they enjoy about school. You know, ask them a lot of open questions. Um, get a real sense that they, you know, are doing okay or find out what they're struggling with in school particularly. Again, remember children aren't very self-aware and mm -hmm. they don't have a language to tell you how they feel. Um, they don't know whether or not they're good at concentrating or not because they find it, that there's no way with, with children that age that they're going to be able to understand a comparison between themselves and other, other pupils. Usually one of the clues is you know, children may say, well, I'm stupid or I'm getting told off a lot at school. Mm -hmm. Really important for the parent to have a good relationship with the teachers. Um, if they do think their child might have ADHD, you know, do a little bit of background research, talk to the teachers on a regular basis and monitor 
um, how your child is progressing through school. Now, you know, the thing about ADHD is it's what's characteristic about ADHD is what's called developmental delay. Yeah. So children with ADHD tend to be two or three years behind their peers, um, which is why often, you know, with the behavior thing in secondary school, they'll say to children, you know, they don't act their age. Well, that's because they're not their age. They tend to be two or three years behind other children. But often they have caught up by the time they've reached their late teens. Right. Uh, so for parents, it is about understanding whether or not you know they think their child's development is a little bit delayed. Communicate a lot with the school. Make sure that the school start putting ADHD-friendly strategies in place straight away if you think it might be ADHD. Don't wait for things to escalate to the point where the child is significantly underachieving, is starting to act out. You know, don't wait till it gets to that stage before you go and speak to your GP. As soon as you think something might be ADHD, start putting those strategies in place, get the school to put those strategies in place. If they persist, you go to see your GP and ask for a referral to a community paediatrician. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's important to realize that this is a medical condition um, and the prognosis actually is very favorable. Um, it's one of yeah. the most treatable conditions there is actually. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, th thank you for that. That's covered a, a whole host of um, uh, bits and pieces we've covered on the MOOC itself. I wondered if your organization, um, the ADHD Foundation, has any events or training courses that you might want to mention to our learners on the MOOC? That's, I mean, that's always on the website. We have we deliver training in schools right across the UK, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of very much around educating teachers. But we also um, we run um, we we also train schools how to work more successfully with parents of children with ADHD. Oh. Um, they're, they're happening all the time right across the UK. Um, and then we have an annual conference, uh, which is in October this year. Uh, I think there's about 500 people coming this year. And it's not just for pediatricians and psychiatrists. There's a lot of nurses, a lot of counselors, a lot of teachers, a lot of SENCOs there. Uh, because we are moving towards what are called integrated services now, where yeah. Yeah. You know, education and health and social care all communicate with each other to make sure that we achieve the best outcomes for children. So that conference happens in October, and anybody who'd like to come to that is certainly very welcome. Um, it's it has a lot of practical um, kind of workshops, but also um, pretty much every leading academic on ADHD in the UK is presenting at that event as well. So yeah, I mean it's the place for cutting edge knowledge. Really, I mean yours is the hub of all information flowing into ADHD at the moment. And it's a uh, a great pleasure to talk to, to you as an individual and, and tap some of your expertise. It really is. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we just be reminded of your website's uh, URL? Um, how do we get onto your it's website? www.adhdfoundation.org.uk So quite simple, adhdfoundation.org.uk Lovely. Well, just thank you once again, Tony. Thank you very much for joining us today and contributing so much to the MOOC. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.